Hi guys, welcome to this revision summary video looking at the entirety of topic 2, which covers states of matter and separation techniques. The aim for this video is to look at all the key things that you need to revise to get yourself ready for the exam. If you want to go into more detail on any particular part, I've put a link in the top right hand corner to the playlist which goes into each section of the video in more detail including practice questions and the model answers for them. So this is just an overview, if you want more detail, have a look at the playlist in the top right hand corner. Okay, if we start off with the particle models then, what you need to be able to do is make sure you can draw and describe the properties of solids, liquids and gases. So if we start off with a solid, remember it should look like this, all the particles should be in a regular pattern, so in rows they should be touching, and if you're asked how they move, they don't move, they vibrate about a fixed position. If we move on to the liquid, remember the liquid takes the shape of the container. It's a random arrangement of particles because they can move past each other. The particles should still be touching and they should flow. And then if we move on to gases, the gases are far apart so they're not touching. They're moving in random directions. You show that with either arrows or these direction lines that I've drawn. And they will always spread out to fill the container. You also need to know what all the state changes are and the names for them. So if you take a solid and you turn it into a liquid, it is melting. If you take a liquid, turn it into a gas, it's evaporating. A gas back down to a liquid is condensing and a liquid down to a solid is freezing. So you should remember those four. But what you may not remember is a solid going all the way up to a gas and that is sublimation. And vice versa, a gas going down to a solid is called deposition. So again, learn those words if you can't remember them. Now, in all likelihood, the questions you guys are going to get to do with state changes and to do with the particle model is all going to be to do with state change graphs. So I've got one here on the left hand side and what you'd be asked to do is tell me what's happening at any of these points and explain the properties. So if we start off with A, the beginning, it's your solid. The particles are touching, it's a regular arrangement, you've got your particle model looking similar to this. At B, that's where melting's occurring. So you'll notice here that the temperature has not increased, it's stayed the same. The reason for that is the energy is not being used to increase the temperature, it's being used to weaken the intermolecular forces, the forces between the molecules. At section C, it's now a liquid, so the particles are still touching, they're flowing past each other, and it's taking the shape of the container. At D, it's evaporating, so very similar to stage B, the temperature stays the same, it doesn't increase. The reason? Energy is being used this time to completely break your intermolecular forces. And then at stage E, it's your gas. Therefore, they're far apart, it's a random movement, and you've got your arrow lines on them. The next part of this video is going to have a look at what purity means and the difference between pure and a mixture. So nice and simply, if something's pure, it's all the same substance. There's only one type of thing in there. You can have a pure element and you can have a pure compound. So an element means it's only got one element in there, for example gold or argon, it's just one of them, nothing else. If it's a compound, you're going to have different atoms in there, but they're all bonded the same way. So you can see here I've got two water molecules, two H2Os, they're both the same, which makes it pure. The second you put something else in there that's not bonded together, so more than one type, it's a mixture, because they can be separated out nice and easily. Now on your state change graphs, you will know if something's pure or not, because it will only have one melting point, it will be flat. If you have a diagonal melting point, like you can see here, so it's not flat, it means you've got a range of melting points. That tells you it's a mixture. Okay, the next section of this video is how do you know what state any substance is when you're given the melting points and the boiling points. So here I've got a sentence that says a substance has a melting point of 27 degrees C and a boiling point of 92 degrees C. What state is it at room temperature? So what I always do is I draw out this diagram here. Solid, liquid and then gas on the right hand side and I put some lines in between the three states. The line on the left, that is your melting point, 27 degrees. The line on the right, that is your boiling point, 92 degrees. The question says, what state is it at room temperature? Now, room temperature is usually around 21. So 21 on here is below my 27 degrees. Therefore, it's going to be a solid. If I look at another example, I have a melting point of minus 200 and a boiling point of 40. You can see that 21 is going to be in between minus 240. 
if it's in the in-between bit, it's a liquid. And then finally, if it melted at minus 200 and boiled at 10, 21 is above 10, therefore it's going to be a gas. Okay, that's the end of the states of matter part of the video. Now on to mixtures and how you can separate them. So the first one we're going to look at is filtration. And filtration, nice and simply, it separates insoluble solids, such as sand. What it does, it will separate them from either a liquid, so it could be water, or a solution, so salt water. Now the reason for that is the insoluble particles are too big, so the sand particles are too big, they will not go through the filter paper. Soluble solids, however, will fit. Therefore, you can't separate them with filtration. You have to use a different technique. And that technique is crystallization. So, as I said, crystallization is used to separate soluble solids. So, for example, salt or sugar from salt or sugar water. So, all you need to do to separate them is to evaporate off the water. So, you heat it up gently with a Bunsen burner. Evaporate off about half of it. If you evaporate any more than that, you might start to get the crystals spitting out. And then you leave it to cool. The rest of the water is going to evaporate off and it will leave your crystals behind. Thus the name crystallization. So that's if you have a solid, whether it's insoluble or soluble. What happens if you have two liquids and you want to separate them? That is all down to distillation. So the first one we're going to look at is simple distillation. So that separates mixtures of two liquids and the key physical property is it's based on their boiling points. So all you do is you heat the solution. So for example, I've got ethanol and water. Ethanol has a boiling point of 78 degrees, water 100 degrees C. So I'm gonna heat it up to my lowest boiling point, around 78 degrees C. At that point, my ethanol is going to evaporate. It's going to turn into a gas, and it's going to move up through the delivery tube and into my condenser. In the condenser, it will condense, so it will turn back down into a liquid. That condenser is surrounded by cold water, that cold water will turn it back into a liquid, and it can be collected. So you'll end up with your ethanol in your flask on the right, and your water remaining behind in your round bottom flask on the left. Now, if you have more complicated mixtures, so for example crude oil or your gases in air, so it's more than just two liquids, usually we use something called fractional distillation to separate them. So that's the same as simple distillation, but it separates more liquids. So to start off with, you heat the solution gently again, and you get something called a temperature gradient. Now that temperature gradient in our fractionating column means it's going to be hotter at the bottom and cooler at the top. So as the top of the column gets to our lowest boiling point, so for example, if I had three substances, one that had a boiling point of 78 degrees, one that's 27 degrees, and one that's 400 degrees, once that top of the column reaches 27 degrees, my first fraction will move into the condenser. So fraction B will move into the condenser, will condense back down into a liquid, and can be collected. You then keep heating the solution. Once it gets up to 78 degrees, Solution A will move into the condenser, and then finally, when you get to 400 degrees, substance C will move into the condenser. So you can separate them all off based on their boiling points. Okay, on to chromatography. Chromatography tells you whether you've got something pure or not, and it tells you what coloured compounds something contains. So it's all due to solubility. So if you have an ink or a mixture that is soluble and you put it through chromatography, the more soluble one will move further up the paper. So what you need to be able to do is tell me how to set up a chromatogram. Number one, you draw a line in pencil. The reason it's got to be in pencil is because it's insoluble and it won't move with the ink up the paper. Number two, place a cross in pencil and add your ink on. Number three, add the paper to your chromatography column and make sure that the ink does not touch the water. If it touches the water, it will wash away and it won't move up the paper. And then finally, all you need to do is let your mobile phase, which is the water, reach the top or close to the top of the paper, which is your stationary phase, and then remove it. And then you'll have your chromatogram, which you can then analyze, which moves on to the next section of the video. So if we have a look at the chromatogram on the left here, you can see that ink A, has two substances in it, because there are two dots, one at two centimetres, one at four centimetres. 
That proves that it's not pure. If it was pure, there would only be one dot. Ink B also has two substances. It's also not pure. And you can say that it's more soluble than A. It has an ink in there that is more soluble. Therefore, it is a different ink to A. And then ink C, you can't tell anything. The only thing you can tell is that it is insoluble. If it's not moved at all, it's not soluble in water. The other thing that you can work out from a chromatogram is the retention factor. A retention factor is something that tells you how soluble it is. And the closer to one it is, the more soluble it is. So if we have a look at this one here, the first thing you have to do is work out how far the ink has moved. So you can see here from the ruler on the left, it's moved six centimeters. Then how far has your water line moved? Again, you can see here, it's moved approximately seven centimeters. So now all I need to do to work out my retention factor is divide the little number six by the big number seven. So it's the distance the ink has moved divided by the distance the water has moved. Six divided by seven goes to 0 0.86, and that is my retention factor, and that is very soluble. Now a key thing here, always remember your retention factor is between zero and one. If you get anything above one, you've done it wrong, go back, swap the numbers around. Okay, onto the final section of this revision video, which is how we make water potable. Potable means safe to drink. Now there are two methods, number one, seawater, and number two, lake water. We're gonna start off with seawater, and that process is called desalination. D, removing sal, salt from the water. So, as you can see from my apparatus on the left, the first thing we need to do is heat the water. What will happen there is the salt will be left behind and the water will evaporate. When it hits the lid at the top here, it will condense, it'll turn back into a liquid. It'll then run across the lid and down and it will be collected separately in the pan on the right. One of your major disadvantages of desalination is it takes up a lot of energy. The second way of making water potable is taking it from lakes or aquifers and making it safe to drink. So there are four processes you need to remember for this one. Number one, screening. Screening is basically where you get a big sieve, something like that, and you take out the large pieces like the twigs, the leaves. Once you've done that, it will move into the sedimentation tank. So the sedimentation tank is where any insoluble bits will start to fall down to the bottom and they'll settle at the bottom of the tank and won't move on into the next tank. So they get removed at that point. The next tank is called the filtration tank. This is where smaller insoluble bits start to get removed. And that happens by putting out layers of sand and gravel, which stop those insoluble bits from moving through. And then the final step is called chlorination. You've probably guessed what that is. Chlorine is added to the tank. When it gets put in there, it sterilizes the solution, sterilizes the water, so it kills all the bad bacteria, the microorganisms, making it safe to drink. It will then go into the storage tank where it is now potable. And the very, very final bit of this video is about chemical analysis. So chemists, or any type of scientist, when they do analysis on a substance or a solution, if they're using water, that water must be pure. Just H2O. If you use tap water, which has got some minerals in, it could give false results. It could make something like a precipitate, and it may tell you that there's something there when actually there isn't. So it's really important that we use pure water so we don't get any false results. And that really is everything that you need to know from the state and separation topic. Hopefully you found that useful, and if you want more detail, have a look at the playlist, which is in the top right-hand corner. Thanks for watching. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.